president of the Japanese American Museum Board of Directors. I've been involved with the museum since the late 80s, shortly after it opened. And um, we have no paid staff here. So we all do this because of the passion to pass on the stories and to learn. Because as much as I thought I knew certain things, um, I keep learning every time I'm here. So um, many of our volunteers say the same thing that they're here to serve, but also to learn. And I'm a retired educator, so lifelong learning is always one of my goals, too. It's just a, a really a big delight to have all these scholars and different people that have kept these stories alive and are wanting to share them. That, you know, we're the vehicles, and we're, we're just wanting to promote more of that, the passing on of the stories. So I facilitate a book club for the museum, and interestingly enough, we're reading a book right now called The Two Worlds of Jim Yoshida. Same thing, he got caught in Japan, he's an American citizen, got caught in Japan and was drafted for the army over there. So I thought, oh, this has a similar theme. So my interest is to see what parallels we have in today's program. So how many of you are here for the first time? Raise your hand. Well, welcome. I hope this isn't your last and that you come back and, and visit us. How many of you are volunteers here at the museum, either the board or other types of volunteerism? Thank you for that. And, um, you know, the pay is not that big, but the benefits are great, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. So at this time, I'd like to hand over the program to our board lead for this particular event, Dr. Steve Fujita. Let's welcome Steve. We're very, very fortunate to have Professor Michael Jin from the great state of Texas to visit us, especially to give us a talk here. And uh, Michael Jin is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Management at uh, Texas, uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And uh, he received his PhD locally from UC Santa Cruz in 2013, history I believe. And his specializations are migration and diaspora studies, Asian American and Pacific Islander history, and critical race and ethnic studies. He's uh, working on a book, uh, which all good assistant professors uh, have to do. Uh, <laughs> it's called Citizens, Immigrants, and the Stateless, Migration and Transnationalism of Japanese Americans in the Pacific, 1930 to 1980. Hopefully it'll be coming out very soon. We'll see it in press very soon. The title of Michael's talk today is The War and Its Aftermath, Nisei Draftees and the Imperial Armed Forces. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, Steve, for the one quick uh, <coughs> introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the Japanese American Museum of San Jose for uh, inviting me to participate in this wonderful program. And a special thanks to Como and um, wonderful. Can you all hear me? Okay. Well, thank you once again, uh, <laughs> Japanese American Museum of San Jose, for inviting me and the uh, uh, oh, whole empire. Okay, good. Um, yes. Okay, is that better? Okay, thank you. Uh, so my special thanks to Como and uh, uh, all the volunteers and staff for their wonderful work um, in putting all this together. I'm thrilled and honored to uh, be joined by Mr. Sano and Mr. Matsuda. I want to thank them for being here to share their experiences with us. Um, and of course, uh, once again, thanks to um, Professor Fujita uh, for moderating, moderating the panel. Um, I know that the story is that Mr. Sano and Mr. Matsuda will tell us are so much more important and compelling than the talk that I'm about to give. So uh, please bear with me as I'll do what historians are trying to, trying to do, which is uh, putting things in um, historical context, and what professors usually do, which is talking about boring stuff. And then we'll hear more interesting stories from these two gentlemen. So uh, both Mr. Matsuda and Mr. Sano are members of the Japanese-American transnational generation, some 50,000 uh, Nisei who spent various amounts of time in Japan before and during World War II. And both of them returned to the United States after the war, and therefore they are Kibei Nisei, or simply Kibei, which means return to America. 
I'll talk briefly about the experiences of Japanese Americans who embarked on trans-Pacific journeys to Japan before World War II, and especially those uh, who became stranded in Japan during the war and served in the Japanese armed forces um, during World War II. I want to focus on how their stories uh, complicate the history of Japanese American wartime experience in general. We know that Japanese Americans who migrate, migrate to Japan at young ages and those who embarked on subsequent journeys to Japan's colonial world uh, in the Pacific rarely appear in popular narratives of Japanese American history. One of the reasons is that a US-centered historical paradigm has confined the history of Japanese Americans to the interior of the American political and cultural boundaries. And moreover, because the Japanese American internment in the United States during, during World War II and the emphasis on Nisei loyalty and nationalism having dominant themes in the post-war scholarship and public history of Japanese Americans, there has been little uh, room for the examination of the wartime experiences of Nisei in Japan and its colonial world. Um, I actually prepared some slides, but I guess uh, the, the projector is not. Oh well. Um, it is no coincidence that the majority of the published works on Nisei experiences in Japan are not scholarly books or articles, but memoirs and autobiographies published in Japanese and English. One of them being Peter Sano's 1000 Days in Siberia, um, which was published by the University of Nebraska Press in 1997. It was translated into Japanese um, and published in Japan in 1999. These accounts reveal remarkable complexities in Kibe experiences that were shaped by the volatile international relations between Japan and the United States that culminated in a bitter and violent war. Examining these experiences can also help us understand how complex, fragile, and elusive the notions about citizenship, loyalty, and nationalism became during the war. We know, of course, that loyalty wasn't simply about choosing between two countries. But in many ways, the Nisei in Japan found themselves in a position where they had to respond to the pressure and demands to profess and even prove their loyalty to, uh, to their parents' homeland. So I would like to give you some very brief background information and context for the Nisei migration to Japan before World War II, and talk about how the Japanese press and policymakers scrutinized Nisei's loyalty after Pearl Harbor that rendered the Japanese Americans in Japan a little room to negotiate their citizenship and loyalty. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. There's Can everybody hear the uh, microphone? Or Can you? Can you all hear me? Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm just not good at <laughs> Okay. I'm just not holding it. Oh, no, okay. Better? Yes. Okay. So um, I'll talk about the, um, the, the context in which the, the, the Japanese Americans migrate to Japan and the Japanese colonial world before World War II. Um, and um, I'll talk about the issue of, issue of Nisei loyalty to the Japanese government during the war. Then I'll talk about the implications of the Nisei men's service in the Japanese armed forces and how this affected their citizenship. By the eve of the Second World War, thousands of second generation Japanese Americans had lived and traveled outside the United States. Um, and the reasons and motivations behind the movements of Japanese Americans across the Pacific were far too diverse to indicate any simple pattern. Uh, numerous economic, social, and personal cir circumstances uh, compelled thousands of young Japanese Americans to embark on trans-Pacific journeys. We know that many of these Nisei were young children accompanying their immigrant parents who decided to return to Japan to resettle there permanently. In other cases, um, the Issei parents in the United States sent their young American-born children to be to Japan to be raised by their relatives um, because 
This was a sensible economic option, especially during the Great Depression. Other Nisei were there on, on short-term short tours sponsored by various Japanese uh, organizations in the United States to experience the culture and society of their parents' homeland. Many Nisei also saw opportunities for employment or higher education in a country that represented an expanding colonial power in Asia, especially during the 1930s. And there were lots and lots of other personal reasons as well, as uh, you'll hear from Mr. Sama and, and um, <coughs> Mr. Matsuda today. Although no official data exists to help determine the exact number of Nisei in Japan before the Pacific War, various sources suggest that between the mid-1930s and the eve of the war in 1941, the number of U.S.-born Japanese Americans residing in Japan remained consistently at close to 20,000. So although we don't have any official data to figure out how many Nisei men and women were in Japan and Japanese colonies during World War II, we can sort of guess that the number would have been somewhere around 20,000, possibly higher, possibly lower. Many of these Nisei found themselves mired in tragic events across the Pacific theater as they became stranded in the country of their parents. Since the Japanese American Museum of San Jose Book Club as um, Aggie mentioned, has selected the two worlds of Jimmy Yoshida, right there, um, for this month's reading. Right. Next week? Yes. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about Jim Yoshida's case to illustrate this complexity. So Jim Yoshida was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, um, and he was 19 years old when he and his mother took a vacation trip to Japan in April 1941. Yoshida did not intend to stay in Japan for a long time because he had a college scholarship waiting for him in the United States. However, as he and his mother prepared their return trip to Seattle in early August of that year, the escalated U.S.-Japan diplomatic tension would forever change the course of his life. As a response to the U.S. embargo of aviation fuel to Japan, the Japanese government suspended all shipping to the United States on August 1, 1941, and this forced Jim Yoshida and other Japanese Americans who had wished to return to, to the United States to be stranded in Japan. For the next few months, Yoshida anxiously waited in his father's hometown in Yamaguchi Prefecture, hoping for the news of normalized diplomacy between the two countries. Instead, the news of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 8th shattered his hope of returning to Seattle and starting college. When he was born in 1921, Jim Yoshida was automatically given Japanese citizenship. Although the Japanese government revised its nationality law in 1924 to allow Nisei in the United States to renounce their Japanese citizenship, Yoshida's parents were oblivious to this changed policy, and their son remained a dual citizen until 1941. And as a dual citizen, Yoshida was now subject to conscription into the Japanese military, for its war against his country of birth. In the fall of 1942, against his will, Yoshida, was conscript, uh, Yoshida um, joined the Japanese army and became a member of the 42nd Division out of Yamaguchi Prefecture, and he would spend the rest of the war years on the Manchurian Front before he, uh, he was repatriated to Japan after the war. Well, more than 110,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans in the United States endured mass incarceration in what the U.S. government euphemistically called the relocation centers from 1942 to 1946. The war also had a significant impact on thousands of Japanese Americans who were stranded in Japan. The Nisei in Japan did what they could do to endure wartime hardships, fire bombing, starvation, and for some, the fear of living in Japan as U.S. citizens. As the battles in Asia Pacific dragged on, the Japanese government drafted an increasing number of Japanese American men to serve in the military, especially during the final phase of the Pacific War in 1944 and 1945. When the war broke out, the Japanese Americans in the, in the um, <coughs> Excuse me, the, the, the war made the issue of citizenship and loyalty ever complicated and elusive for the Japanese Americans in Japan. Although their U.S. citizenship did not compel the Japanese government to treat them as enemy aliens, 
Many Nisei in Japan nevertheless faced a mounting pressure to demonstrate their support for the Japanese war effort against their country of birth. As soon as Japan's war with the United States commenced in December 1941, the Japanese press began to scrutinize Nisei's nationalism. Um, <clears throat> influential Japanese journalist Tomoatsu uh, Toshio, for example, uh, admonished Japanese Americans to abandon any lingering allegiance to their American citizenship. He told Nisei in his 1942 essay titled Kaisen to Zaibeido, or Our Compatriots from the United States in the Wake of the War, that, and I quote, Nisei's American birth certificate is only a scrap of paper. And, he's, and he continued, and I quote again, if Nisei were clever enough, they would have already recognized that the land of their birth is but a false and base foreign country, unquote. And there were signs that the Japanese policymakers and political commentators were suspicious of Japanese American residents' ability to become loyal Japanese citizens. For instance, leading Japanese policy analysts like <clears throat> Nakasa Setsuo and Muraka Mitsugio doubted Nisei's ability to become loyal subjects of the Jap Japanese Empire. Murakami went so far as to claim that Nisei's American character disqualified them from becoming productive Japanese citizens in spite of their education in Japan. He wrote in 1943, and I quote, however much the Nisei in Japan are made to know about their ancestral land's divinity, and however much is cultivated in them in the, the spirit of sincerity, they were not fit to join the greater East Asia, quote, prosperity sphere, unquote. Although none of these general, uh, Japanese thinkers held a radically negative view of the Japanese Americans in Japan or branded them as enemy aliens, their cautious distrust of the Nisei was enough to alarm some Japanese American residents in Japan, such as <clears throat> Tamotsu Murayama, who was a California-born Nisei who worked for the ja uh, Japan Times in Tokyo and the Japanese Foreign Ministry's Intelligence Bureau during the war. In his wartime writings in Japan, Murayama persistently urged Japanese readers to recognize Nisei as loyal citizens and soldiers for the emperor. Another Nisei writer in Japan, Noboru Fred Miike, also tried to demonstrate his loyalty to Japan by joining the Japanese propaganda effort during the war. His wartime writings criticized racial discrimination in the United States and praised Japan's war efforts as an anti-imperial quest to liberate racial minorities in the U.S. territories in the Pacific. The Hawaii-born Nisei wrote, and I quote, no reasonable person of any color skin, white, black, yellow, red, or brown, would want to fight for a country, the United States, that does not grant him equality, unquote. Now, regardless of how sincere Murayama and Miike's patriotism to Japan really was, their passionate articulation of loyalty to Japan secured their positions as influential journalists during the uh, Pacific War. Their case offers an opportunity to explore how <laughs> complex and salient the issue of loyalty to the Japanese government was to many Japanese American strandies in wartime Japan. The pressure was on Nisei in Japan to demonstrate their allegiance to the Japanese government, and no, ma no matter the intention, they could only prove their loyalty through their words and actions. To many Nisei in Japan, articulation of loyalty had as much to do with survival as the means to fight for the emperor. But of course, those Nisei men in Japan who proved their loyalty to the Japanese government by joining its armed forces paid a heavy price for their service to the emperor. Their experiences illuminate an important gendered dimension of loyalty and citizenship. For many Nisei male dual citizens who were stranded in Japan during the war, the Japanese government's claim of their citizenship forced them to take arms against the Allied powers, and these, Nisei milita these Nisei's military service under duress cost them their American citizenship and permanently excluded them um, from the dominant public narrative of Japanism, but no loyalty and Americanism. And of course, many Nisei in the Japanese military paid the ultimate price as the war claimed their lives on the battlefields. After the war, the United States government strictly enforced the provisions in Section 401 of the 1940 Nationality Act, 
According to this law, the Japanese Americans who served in the Japanese armed forces during the war had committed the treasonous act of, quote, serving in the armed forces of a foreign state without authorization of the United States and bearing arms against the United States government. Because the Japanese military records do not specify whether or not their servicemen during World War II held foreign citizenship, it is difficult to ascertain the number of Nisei men who were forced to fight against the Allied forces during World War II. Nisei male dual citizens of military age in Japan could have numbered more than a couple thousand. But only a handful of accounts of former Japanese American servicemen in the Japanese military emerged in the latter half of the 20th century such as these, some of these. What these stories have in common is that these Nisei men had to continue to deal with the complex question of loyalty after the war, as many of them struggled to readjust to the post-war life. And also, it took many of these Nisei veterans pains to regain their U.S. citizenship. The process that required them to prove to the U.S. government that they had been loyal American citizens all along, despite their military service to the Japanese emperor. I will turn to the case of Shigeo Yamada, who served in the Japanese Navy, and revisit the case of Jin Yoshida to illustrate the implications of Nisei military service in Japan on their post-war experiences, as well as their citizenship status. Shigeo Yamada was a Nisei who grew up on a potato farm in, uh, in the great state of Idaho, and moved to Japan in 1939 after graduating from high school to enroll in a Japanese immersion program at Nichibei Gakuen, which was a uh, school create, uh, catered to young Nisei students in Japan. He also studied later at Keio University in Tokyo. Although university students were initially exempted from military service, the Japanese government reversed this policy and started to conscript young men out of colleges in December 1943 when the Japanese battlefield casualty rate was reaching a staggering 20%, meaning one out of five men um, were suffering from um, serious injuries or, or, or death on the battlefields. So Shigeo Yamada left Tokyo in the fall of 1944 to start training in the Navy Signal Corps, where he specialized in decoding enemy wireless transmissions because he was a native English speaker. He was commissioned as an ensign on uh, Christmas Day of 1944, and upon completion of his training, he was dispatched to the cruiser Yahagi, which joined the 10th squadron near Sumatra. Joining him on Yahagi was another Nisei junior officer named Shigeaki Pramoto, who was a football player at Meiji University in Tokyo before joining the Navy. On April 6, 1945, Five days after the commencement of the Battle of Okinawa, that signified the near complete victory of the Allied forces, Yamada and Kuramoto's Yahagi escorted the famed battleship Yamato into South China Sea in what would turn out to be the Japanese Navy's final desperate sortie. Yamada and Kuramoto's main task was monitoring radio traffic between the Allied fleet and pilots and then translating the transmissions uh, simultaneously again because of their ability to um, speak and understand English fluently. The next day, hundreds of American planes joined the Allied submarines in a one-sided battle that nearly wiped out the Japanese naval squadron. Yamada survived miraculously in spite of being, in his own words, an idle potato who didn't know how to swim, <laughs> but his fellow Nisei junior officer, Kuramoto, was not as fortunate as he drowned with nearly 3,000 Japanese sailors aboard the ships that day. For Shigeo Yamada and other Nisei who served in the Japanese military in the Pacific and returned to Japan alive, their ability to speak English offered them an opportunity to work for the Allied Occupation Forces in charge of governing Japan after the war. Despite these Nisei's acts of disloyalty to the United States during the war, the U.S. occupation government embraced their service in various uh, civil staff sections as their language skills proved to be a valuable asset. After his discharge from the Japanese Navy, Shigeo Yamada returned to Tokyo and worked for the civilian <coughs> intelligence section at the general headquarters 
or the Supreme Commander for the Allied Forces, or SCAP, the office that was, which was in charge of ruling Japan. Yamada's background as a Japanese naval officer helped secure his employment in 1946 by SCAP. Uh, and he conducted security surveillance by analyzing the activities of what SCAP identified as radically inclined Japanese groups, such as organized labor and right-wing militarist groups. Because his service in the Japanese armed forces had stripped his U.S. citizenship, Yamada was employed by SCAP as a member of the Japanese civilian staff. So he was stripped of the US, his U.S. citizenship because his military record in Japan had made him disloyal. But ironically, this act of disloyalty to the U.S. government during the war also made him a highly valuable asset to the U.S. government in occupied Japan after the war. Jim Yoshida also worked for the Allied Occupation Forces after the war. He was a civilian, civilian employee for the British Commonwealth Forces um, that occupied Mizuba in uh, <clears throat> Yamaguchi Prefecture. Yoshida was determined to recover his U.S. citizenship, and he did it by proving his loyalty to the U.S. government. As he wrote in his memoir, he had no desire to fight for the Japanese military during World War II and insisted that he was torn by what he described as a hell of a fix in which he found himself. So when the Korean War broke out in 1950, 1950 he was only eager to show his loyalty to, to the country of his birth. And he volunteered to work as a civilian uh, interpreter for the U.S. Army in Korea, where he spent more than six months in combat zones. Yoshida hoped that helping the American war efforts in Korea would boost his chance of recovering his U.S. citizenship, which he had lost as a result of his service to the, uh, in the Japanese military. It took Yoshida great pains to regain his citizenship as he, navigate, uh, he navigated the um, bureaucratic red tape to obtain a special visa that allowed him to travel to Hawaii and file a civil suit in the U.S. court against the U.S. government for taking his citizenship away. And it wasn't until 1954 that Yoshida regained his U.S. citizenship and resettled in Hawaii. On the other hand, for Shigeo Yamada, the question of loyalty was not, sim not a simple matter of choosing side. Like Jim Yoshida, the thought of fighting in the war against the United States had deeply troubled Shigeo Yamada's conscience. And he admitted that he had obeyed the conscription order only to avoid being thrown into jail. Nevertheless, Yamada also admitted that he had accepted military duty for the Japanese emperor as his service to the people of the same blood. So after the war, unlike Jim Yoshida, Shigeo Yamada decided not to recover his U.S. citizenship because despite the fact that he had served in the Japanese Navy reluctantly, he felt guilty about fighting against the United States. He told Michael Hirsch of the Associated Press in 1990 about his, uh, his reason not to recover his U.S. citizenship and resettle in America. And he said, and I quote, I don't conscious, consciously feel it's right because I did take arms against my country of birth, unquote. So as these cases show, when the war forced many Nisei men in Japan to fight um, against the United States, against their will, the question of loyalty affected them in many different ways. What they shared in common, however, was that however reluctant they were about serving in the military and taking arms against the United States, the Nisei strandiers had little choice but to fulfill their duty as Japanese citizens. I, um, I wanted to. So, the diverse experiences of Japanese Americans in various corners of the Pacific during World War II demonstrate that the meaning of loyalty was far complex and fragile than the matter of choosing between two countries. For many Nisei strategies in Japan, the war blurred the cultural, political, and even legal boundaries of their uh, nationality, as they found themselves in a situations in which they had little room to negotiate their national allegiance. The Japanese government's treatment of American citizens of Japanese ancestry during the war never amounted to the mass incarceration endured by Japanese Americans in the United States. Nevertheless, the loyalty of Nisei Strandis to their ancestral land was under close scrutiny, and they responded in various ways to render their service to the Japanese war effort against the Allied forces. 
many of them very, very hesitantly and um, reluctantly. So, when the Japanese government exercised the right to demand Japanese American men's legal obligation to serve in the Japanese military, these state directors and volunteers' service to the ancestral land stripped them of their American citizenship. And as Jim Yoshida and Shigeo Yamada's cases demonstrate, although Nisei veterans of the Japanese military could recover their U.S. Um, citizenship after the war, the onus was on them once again to convince the U.S. government that they had been forced to serve the Japanese emperor under duress. So I'll stop here, and uh, I'll welcome Mr. Sun and Mr. Thomas so to share their stories. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is uh, a local guy, uh, Jimmy Matsuda. And uh, Jimmy was born in Hood River, Oregon, where he was raised on a farm uh, when his family, River, where his family knew the Minya Sui family. And uh, in 1938, uh, Jimmy went to J Japan with his family uh, on a Christmas vacation and uh, he became ill and uh, he was hospitalized I think for two weeks approximately and his family after that they missed the boat and he, uh, they decided to stay in Japan basically. Um, after graduating high school in Japan uh, Jimmy volunteered for the Japanese Navy. Uh, he returned to the U.S. in the early 1950s and became a gardener where he's been working out of Sunnyvale for uh, all these years. Uh, Jimmy recently retired from the U.I. Kai Board where he served for over 24 years. And uh, beyond that, uh, Jimmy and his staff have kept the U.I. Kai front area beautiful for something like 20 years, and Geico has helped out in the end of uh, His favorite flowers are the patients in the spring and the cyclone in the winter. So I give you uh, Jimmy Matsuda. Matsuda, and uh, I came through a lot of, well, I would say, uh, unhappy things because I was an American citizen everywhere I went to. And uh, as I finished high school, they made me volunteer to uh, Okay, I think you can hear me now. They made me volunteer to do a lot of work, and they, a lot of people didn't know that I understood the English. And uh, one day at uh, the place where I was taking training, well, uh, they found out that I spoke real good English, and they asked me why, I mean, where did I learn my English? So it was uh, during the high school in the second year, I told them I was born and raised in America, and when they found out that I was doing everything, I was flying an airplane at school, and uh, when I graduated, but nobody believed me that I flew an airplane. But uh, as the war got worse, that they uh, told me that I had to go to Okinawa, and that was the time that there was only, only two boats leaving Japan, and after that, well, they don't know what's going to happen. And I was in that group. But one day, as I was in Fukuoka, Japan, this one uh, Japanese guy, he started pointing at me from behind me. And uh, he says, the guy in front of me, me, so he speaks English. And this guy comes to me, he says, you speak English? I told me I was born in America. <laughs> so, 
well, can you stay here and start translating? And that was in Fukuoka, Japan, that I helped translating for the U.S. government. And after that, too, now, I was still young yet, right after high school, so uh, I kind of volunteered more like a, uh, uh, what would I say? I wasn't against the Japanese people, but still, when I seen their faces, it hurt my feelings, you know. So one time, I had a big fight with the policeman, and uh, there's a couple of other guys, and they said, what happened to the guy? Oh, he's uh, from America. So they start teasing me, so I myself start using a little boxing I knew that <laughs> The policeman found out later he was in the hospital three weeks. <laughs> he didn't even put me as fun. The reason uh, we did that was one of my best friends, his name is Casey Lada, passed away, but uh, he says, come on, Jimmy, you've got to beat up those Japanese policemen, you know? So every time I, well, I shouldn't say that, I was drinking that time, I would catch a policeman and then knock him out, and then and, and, uh, he would go to the hospital. I think there was three policemen that went to the hospital. I don't want that out afterwards. <laughs> but uh, still, after that, well, when the occupation forces came in, uh, they made me stay at the camp in Camp Kokura. And I did a lot of work over there because there's very few Niseis that came out and spoke English. So uh, I stayed there for, oh, I don't know how long, but uh, Everybody that worked in the camp where I was, well, I treated them like a family, and we got along real good. And one day, I decided to uh, go to uh, come to America. So uh, I told my sister, I said, "Hey, Sada, I'm going to go to America now." He says, "Who's going to pay for it?" <laughs> and she says, "Well, okay." You work, and I'll work too in America, and then uh, you pay me back. And uh, I come to America here again and stayed, and then when I stayed at my sister's place, uh, I started doing gardening. And all that time, while uh, I stayed as a landscaping gardening and uh, started raising my family and everything. So, one day, uh, there was some, oh, and then when I went to Japan, I met this fella, his name was uh, Wadak Keiji, and he looked at me, and you know how the Japanese people, they stare at you like that, <laughs> and he was lighting a cigarette, and he looked at me, and he come to me and says, aren't you from America? I said, yeah. Then we got a real nice together doing everything. But him and I, right after that, the uh, 24th Infantry Division came to uh, Camp Kokura. It's where you know my parents were staying. And I stayed there, and then one day, I was waiting for a streetcar, and then this fellow, Casey Wada, he sticks his hand in the pocket and takes out an American cigarette Smoking them. I looked at him and then we both said, Oh, he's speaking English too, huh? <laughs> and after that, well, we went out drinking. That's <laughs> 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 the one thing we could do. <laughs> but uh, after that, and then after that, well, they found out that I was in the Japanese uh, uh, military too, because they made you a volunteer. And before I went into the military at high school, I was already flying an airplane, and then, so I, I didn't take training on that, but they took me as a, oh, that guy there is a Hakujin. You know, he said, well, they called me American now because I spoke English. <laughs> but I went through that too, and after the war, uh, before I left, my mother says, hey, Jimmy, says, uh, I don't want you to come back alive. 
He says, you have died for the country. And I said, well, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she says that my ashes will be at the Yasukuni Jinja shrine there. Which I didn't know what kind of a shrine it was. I found out later what it was, or where it was, nothing. But I did that. And then one day after the war, I stayed in the school of Japan doing a lot of translating. And uh, then uh, they told me to go home. So I caught the tra uh, thing. And once I caught the uh, train to go to Kokura, there was two young ladies. And they were sitting in front of me. And uh, they stood up and uh, said, hey, you sit down. Because I had still had the Japanese come because of pilot. Uh, I uh, said, well, I work for the country, so that's okay. But uh, I said, no, no, that's okay. And I, but after that, uh, the Japanese uh, chief of police, we were Americans, the whole thing was American, so they had an eye on us. You know, so they checked who was, uh, how old we were. And after that, they said, could you work as an interpreter? So it's Camp Kokura. I stayed there and worked as an interpreter for many, many years. And then after uh, that, um, I uh, started, well, I won't say, I shouldn't say, start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that time, you know, when we started drinking and everything. And then I even, me and my friend, his name is Wada Keiji. We would beat up the policemen and everything. They knew that we were Americans already, so they never turned their hands on us. <laughs> we had a, I had a nice time. I followed any person that I didn't like. <laughs> the GIs too, you know. They used to call me Jap and things like that. Well, I didn't like that. You know, so I said, hey, and I'm here working with you guys. I don't want to hear that word, Jap. Well, why aren't you a Jap? And then uh, I start to blow my top up the sky. I said, Jimmy, don't pay no attention. So I you know, ignored him. But later on, he came to me and said, sorry that you know, they called me a Jap and everything like that. But I had a rough time there going through uh, uh, after the war because my Japanese wasn't 100% Japanese, I would say, you know, so whatever I did, I did everything okay, but whatever I did wrong, the policeman would come to me, and then uh, on occasion, hey, Jimmy, the policeman's here again. So one time, I was half, had a little bit too much sake, <laughs> the only young uh, uh, place, and says, you come outside. As soon as uh, I went outside, I stopped beating him up because I knew he was going to come after me. And then so this uh, friend of mine, Rod McCage, he said, hey, Jimmy, you better watch out now. He's going to come and hit you. And I was all prepared for that. But yes, he sure did. And uh, he started cussing me up in English, you know, <laughs> so. And uh, we started fighting each other. And uh, then this policeman kind of stopped us. Mr. Wada says, hey, let's kill that guy. So we went after him, and he was in the hospital three, three weeks. Oh my God, so uh, they didn't want to touch us because they knew that we were Americans already. Uh, I went through that, and then uh, I worked for the occupation forces for many, many years before I come to America. Uh, it didn't hurt my citizenship because I found out later that I was an American and I had to do what the Japanese you know, told me to do or else they put me in jail. And then my oldest brother, he was in the Japanese uh, military already and he was in uh, Manchuria. So uh, my brother says, hey Jimmy, don't mention you and me were brothers because uh, I was from America, and they didn't know who I was, you know. But I got through there all right. And one 
day, uh, when the Americans start coming to Japan, and uh, they were looking for the interpreters or people that speak English, and my sister, two, three sisters, me and uh, my other sister, we all spoke English, so we were hired right away as an you know, interpreter. Uh, something has happened. Happened. And one day, Mr. Wada says, "Hey, Jimmy," he says, "We gotta start doing this, doing that." He was a bad guy in America, fighting all the time, and everything. So he began to build up a little bit of a gang, you know, thing there. I says, "No more. No. I don't want to fight no more." So you know, because I was in the Japanese military uh, kamikaze fly, flying airplane already. Uh, just before I, they wanted me to go to Okinawa, and that was the time that uh, they start bombing Okinawa. So I didn't have to go, but uh, if I did go, I don't think I'll be standing here. <laughs> but I had a tough time on speaking uh, Japanese too, a real tough time. But my uncle, he was a well-known person. He had a big sawmill in Japan. They all knew him, so uh, I was training really good. And the uh, teacher, there was two American teachers uh, living close to Beaver, and during the war, they couldn't go back to America. So you know, we got real good friends. And after the war, those two teachers, they came to us and said, could you guys teach English? Because we spoke English all the time. And uh, we did uh, uh, work for the uh, those two uh, people, and one day uh, something came up. My sister and me, we couldn't get along at all. And every time we turn our faces together, well, we're always arguing, you know. And even in uh, when we were kids, we had a big farm, and when I go fishing and everything, she would pick up the rocks and throw them. <laughs> 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 I went through that. But later on, as we grew up, she says, hey, Jimmy, it's not fun, huh, fighting each other no more. So I says, yeah, we got to get together because mom and dad and my other sisters, they're all in Japan, yeah. So we did that, and then finally we got called in, and we came, one by one, as they called, I came, my youngest brother, he was fighting in Korea already. And my other brother, too, he was fighting in Korea. And then when my chance came, well, I told the uh, uh, general, I said, look what I got from Uncle Sam. And he said, why do you have to worry? I said, well, I got this. They told me to go to a certain, certain place. Oh, no, no, it's okay. You just stay here. And then you go to Korea and fight. I said, go to Korea and fight. But during that time, uh, I didn't have to call you because I showed this to the, uh, 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 he was an officer, and I said, look what I got, they told me to go to Korea right now. He read the paper, he said, no, Jimmy, tear that up, you don't have to go, I'll back you up. And uh, after that, after he tore up the paper, you know, a year later, uh, they said nothing to me, so I was a free man all the time. But yet, if I did something bad, the Japanese policeman was always behind me because they knew that I was an American and they knew where I lived and they knew these young people uh, there you know, work with me so they'll help me out instead of me uh, hitting the Japanese guy. You know. And I had a tough time, but uh, I don't know why I'm still standing up here. <laughs> Because my uh, friend, Mr. Wada, says, hey, Jimmy, you know, you and me were just about the only guys who, uh, we, that time, uh, knew that we were from America. And there was only three other people that were living in that area. But one day, I told him, hey, Casey, I'm going to go to America once more. I did, and after that too, uh, I got along with him real good. But uh, 
we used to smoke two, three packs a day. American sicker than. So he says, oh, no, Jimmy, I don't think I can stay with you for so long. But we got together all the way. And his father and mother, they spoke real good English. They were Ishii people, but spoke real good English. And I survived that, too. And then once I told my sister, uh, you know, that uh, she's going to go to America once more and stay at a friend's house and then do house cleaning. So uh, she says, if you want to come to America, I'll save the money so that you could pay me and then, you know, start working there. And uh, it was a year later, I had this Japanese gardener and uh, he had to go to Japan for his uh, brother, somebody died. And he said, hey, Jimmy, I'm doing gardening, but you take care of my job. And when I took care of his job, come back, well, he says, who helped you? I says, I did everything by myself. And then one day, this Hakujin lady, she comes to me and says, you know that guy there? She says, you know that guy there? And uh, he says, yeah, you should see him work. He would never, you know, stand up and look at things. You know, he just kept on working. So that lady too, she says, oh, geez, that must be, the, you know, Japanese. some Japanese aren't like that. And I worked over there for a while. And then my sister one day says, hey, Jimmy, uh, I was gonna, she was going to do something. But she and the husband bought a place. And uh, they wanted me to help her out. But this uh, Nihon Jun guy from, uh, that was helping my sister said, no, I want to use Jimmy. And I helped him start doing gardening. <coughs> And his uh, sister passed away in L.A. So he says, could you do gardening all by yourself? And so I did that three weeks. And when I did that, the Hakujin ladies came out and says, who is that guy? And he said, I said, well, I have that guy there. He would say good morning, but that's all he would say. And then he'll be working every time. He doesn't sit around like these other people. <laughs> and then this one lady come out and says, Here, Jimmy, I have uh, this car key. Could you back the car out of the garage? And I said, Yeah, okay, okay. And soon as I back the car out of the garage, he says, You keep the key. He says, The way you work and the way uh, you, know, you drove the car, I'm pretty sure you're okay. And so uh, I got the job over there, and then one day, this uh, Japanese friend, his uh, friend says he had to come to uh, over Los Angeles because his friend passed away. And during that time, I worked by myself as a gardener. And all the Hagujin ladies, uh, when he uh, come back, he says, who is that guy there? <laughs> and they're pointing at me. And I said, uh, real, real naughty Hakujin lady. If I touched her car, hey, that's my car, don't touch it. <laughs> you know? But she found out what kind of person I was. And after that, she said, oh, Jimmy, could you wipe my car? Could you start my car up? You know? <laughs> and uh, I was treated real nice that way, too. I told my sister that. She says, yeah, you got to be nice or else you won't get a job in here. Uh, after he did, uh, my sister, Oh, said uh, his uh, helper was sick in L.A., so he left me behind just with the rake, the truck, and everything. And he says, I got to go to the funeral. And I stayed there and took that job three weeks. And that Hakuzin lady says, hey, don't fire him. Keep that guy. <laughs> the way he worked, he said, before I left for he would always, you know, Polish the car and sneak up, uh, sleep out the garage and everything. And so they all liked me, so I start uh, working there. And then one day, my sister said, hey, Jimmy, she says, you want to work by yourself? I said, sure, anytime. And I start working by myself first as 
going there in the morning, washing the car, wiping the car so that she can go to work back and forth. I did that for a while. And then when I uh, got used to the place where I was, my sister says, hey, Jimmy, we want to do this, we can do that. And I helped everything out because my sister says, you know, if you quit here, I got to quit because she doesn't know how to do this. She doesn't know how to do that. And I did. So I used to even sweep the garage every morning. That's the kind of lady I want. She looks at the car, fingerprint on the car, and says, Jimmy, look at that, look at that. So I was a real honest lady until I worked there. But my sister said, hey, Jimmy, you know, we're going to go, uh, go to uh, L.A. because her brother-in-law uh, has a nursery and then they're going to move out there. So what you going to do? I said, well, I'll stay here and do the gardening. And then my sister said, okay, if you're going to stay here, you got to pay for the uh, rent and everything. And I said, sure, I can do that. You know? And after that, well, uh, I started doing that, and I got uh, well known. Words got around to the Japanese people and Hakushin people. Hey, that gardener there, that gardener there, you know, he's a real good worker. So I had jobs all over the place. And then one day I went to California, was going somewhere, and my sister says, "No, Jimmy, either, you know, work uh, work for another job because too many guys want job." Well, I quit that job and uh, started doing gardening by myself. And after that, the yeah, I had jobs coming left and right. But uh, I was, uh, my uh, family uh, was still in Japan that time, so I had to work to help my family in Japan. And uh, I stayed there for quite a while. And then finally, they had, my sister says, Oh, Jimmy, why don't you rent an apartment? So I rented an apartment, and uh, I made her stay there. And uh, after that, well, all the Hakujins around that place where I worked, they were hiring Japanese people, because they see me work. Hey, I want to work a uh, guy working like that. You know. but, uh, I kept my mouth shut, after that, I guess I was on my own but up until now. I'm still, I'm pretty close to 100. I'm not quite 100 years old. <laughs> Running around, working, and uh, you know, my wife too says, how come you work every day? I said, I'm going to work. You know, but, uh, I'm still you know, running around, doing everything. Any help is needed. All right, our third speaker is uh, Peter Sano. And uh, Peter grew up in Brawley, uh, typical. Japanese farm, I guess, was a little larger than the average uh, J farm. Uh, at age 15, uh, this is a really interesting twist in his story, uh, he was sent as a Yoshi to Japan to be take the name of uh, his childless, who happened to be a rich uncle, uh, on it that was his mother's side. And uh, so that's when uh, Peter went to Japan. He was, uh, again, 15 at that time. Uh, he attended high school in Tokyo, and he was drafted into the Japanese Army in 1945. Uh, after being a POW in Siberia for almost three years, uh, Peter returned to Japan in 1948. I guess he was the first of that wave of, of uh, Japanese soldiers that the Russians released. Uh, he worked as an occupation, uh, an interpreter during the occupation the speaker has mentioned before. Uh, and when he came back to the U.S., uh, Peter worked as a gardener uh, with his dad. 
but he soon became an architect uh, for the Minton Lumber Company. And that's a famous family, I guess, a lot of you that uh, did a lot with the Japanese American community. Very supportive. Uh, Peter and his wife live in, uh, in Monaco, live in uh, Palo Alto, and they've been active in a lot of Bay Area humanitarian efforts uh, after the war, uh, such as the Vietnam War protests, uh, the farm worker movement, and also uh, they've been active in the support for refugees. So, we've done a lot of good work here in the Bay Area. So, with that, I could be Peter. Yes. 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 <laughs> uh, in the introduction <coughs> about all the things I did in Siberia, the main part, and that's my talk is always central on that. However, I was told that on this occasion I should talk about my military, and it's only six months is what I spent in the Japanese military. Um, I'll, I'll re read a portion here. I was drafted in Tokyo. Although the 150 recruits in our group did very little while waiting for the day of our departure, we watched others who had arrived before us undergo training. One interesting exercise involved a tank made of cardboard. The young soldiers practiced throwing hand grenades at the stand. The mock grenade was tied to a bamboo pole which the men grabbed and went through the motion of casting at the tank. The officer and sergeant uh, stressed that the training we would receive overseas would be nothing like this kind of drill. We would be given a box of sand in place of explosive with which we would practice diving under a tank. And actually, uh, after, when I arrived at my destination in Manchuria, uh, we do go, uh, as part of our early training, we did go through that kind of uh, uh, training, that is, uh, how to take up this box and dive under the tank. The box had, uh, a strap on which you put around your neck and it has a little uh, uh, horn sticking out at the bottom and they were, those were the two triggers. By that I meant when we dove under a tank we were supposed to stretch our arm and that, that would trigger, that was one trigger and the other one was when we hit the ground that was the other one they had so that if one failed the other would work. They, they had it uh, uh, made in that way. The prospect of my becoming a human bomb in this manner did not frighten me much, as strange as it may sound. This kind of self-sacrifice, often called a kamikaze way, was not a notion foreign to soldiers or even to an average citizen then. From childhood, the Japanese were taught that it is a great honor Indeed, a duty to sacrifice oneself for the sake of the emperor and the country. In an elementary school textbook, there was a story of three soldiers who during an earlier campaign in China willingly carried a bomb into a barbed wire entanglement to blow it up and themselves with it to create a opening through which other soldiers could run to attack the enemy. This was presented to the children as a model of an exemplary and honorable act that any and all Japanese were expected to follow. <coughs> and uh, one question that somebody asked me once was, uh, you, you were sent to Japan, when, and when you were going to Japan, you were sent to Japan, and I didn't object to that. No, I didn't. It was, uh, I guess I, was, I grew up uh, listening to quote authority and in this case my parents said uh, you have to go to Japan because your uncle doesn't have a child and you're to be adopted I went uh, I write about that, uh, that I didn't have any objection and then 
So in the military, I guess I was trained to follow instruction, and that's what, so I I felt that being a soldier, all this was just you didn't question that. No. And then, then on this map, those in the back may not see it very well, but uh, after one week in Tokyo, then we leave, and I fortunately I, I leave Tokyo uh, on the 7th of March, and March 10th is the day they had that big bombing in Tokyo, where uh, uh, they say they estimate that 100,000 were the casualty was 100,000 uh, Tokyo citizens. <coughs> and then, uh, then from Tokyo, I go to Hakata, Tucson, go through Korea, and I finally arrive at Haida. It's about 100 miles from the border with the Soviets. And that's where my military training begins. Uh, I was told that uh, my talk should focus on the military, so that's all I'm going to talk about, and not, not about my, my prison experience. That, uh, that evening, we entered the gate of the 118th Regiment of the Kwantan Army. Sixteen of us were placed in one squad, and each of us, in turn, was interviewed by the personnel officer, and I was the last one to be interviewed. From my records, the officer knew that I was born in the United States. He gave me a stern warning that I was to work extra hard to, to prove my loyalty to Japan because of my birthplace. He mentioned that my parents in America had been sent to a concentration camp and told me how important it was for me to become a good Japanese soldier and fight and even die if necessary for Japan. Now, I would be fighting with weapons in hand against the country of my birth. I, <coughs> I was relieved that I was stationed in Manchuria, not in the South Pacific where I would actually be fighting with American soldiers, perhaps even my own brother among them. I accepted my fate to fight for Japan as an adopted Japanese, but at the same time, I did not have a strong sense that America was my enemy. As strange and confused as my, may, this may sound, the doodle raid on Tokyo or the site of B-29 bombers flying overhead on their bombing runs did not invoke in me an enormous amount of hostility or hatred towards America. I recall the time in Tokyo when one of my classmates at school and I was, saw a formation of warplane flying above us. My friend said, look at those planes, we've got a lot of them and we are um, strong enough to defeat America. See, we are well prepared for a war with the country you c come from. How about that? It was clear that he looked at me as his enemy. There were other such occasions when my classmates would talk t to me as if I were not a Japanese like them, but an American. There were they would compare the two countries and say that Japan was superior, implying that they and their were better than I and whatever I represented. I look back on my days in America where some, sometimes I was not treated as a true American. And now here in Japan, I believe that I was not considered a true Japanese either. It was as though I did not really belong to either country. By the time I went into my squad room, it was, everyone had turned in. I sat in utter darkness. 
my heart was heavy. Here I was about to begin group living, which I would never really like. This group living was that of, of the military. Sadness, anger, and deep despair over this turn of event was more than I could be there. I felt as if I had been thrown into a dark, cold, and bottomless pit from which there was no escape. And so that was my military training. And one thing, uh, after the <coughs> surrender, uh, I don't write about it, but after the surrender, uh, there was some rumor going around uh, that they did, actually soldiers did use that box and tried to blow up the enemy tank. But uh, they say they failed because the armament underneath was, <coughs> was very thick, made for uh, what's that? It's, it's, uh, it, for any kind of bomb to, to explode underneath. So it, 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 they say that uh, there was rumor going around among the prisoners saying that that failed. So uh, I don't know how many soldiers actually tried that. Uh, that's about it. And just very briefly about my experience as a prisoner, uh, I, I have over 100 books written by other prisoners, uh, which I have collected. And uh, one thing that every prisoner writes about, there are actually uh, four things. One is hunger. Everybody talks about starvation. However, I write, I have a big however in my book. When you look at the Russians, what they're eating, it's, it's not very good either. <laughs> and then, then I write in my book, uh, three years after uh, I'm a repatriator, I go back to Japan, and what do I see? Things are in ration. And so the Japanese aren't eating well even three years after the surrender. So uh, I have a big however for the Russians saying that uh, the Russians themselves are not eating very well at, during those earlier days. And then number two is the cold. And I, I guess you could blame them for taking us to Siberia and putting us in prison. But the, the coldest I saw was uh, coming out from the night shift when I was working in the coal mine. It was minus 66. <laughs> That's centigrade. And which comes to my calculation says something like 79, minus 79 Fahrenheit. That, uh, I mean, we used to say anything colder than minus 50 didn't make any difference, which is probably true. And then, so, uh, shortage of food, uh, the coal, and then the labor. And la labor was hard, but uh, I have one uh, the Jap Japan Journal, I think it was, I had a, a review by them, and they write in there that, uh, especially my experience on the farm, I spent one summer on the farm, and uh, the reviewers mentioned, changed the incident a little, and it's almost like a uh, camp summer camp. <coughs> I, 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 I think I was very fortunate in a lot of ways and I and the work was like I do uh, squirrel catching. That was my job to do squirrel catching. And the, the, all the Russian wanted was for me to turn in the pelts so that he, he sold that uh, on the market. And, and, uh, and there, there was no, uh, oh, what, there was no norm for that either. I didn't have to catch. I just caught as many as I could, and and, and we ate the meat. I, I together with other prisoners, I shared the meat to eat. That the fur I had to turn in, things like that. I was very lucky, and uh, and I 
actually where I suffered the most as a prisoner was from the whole army system they had and uh, we had a sergeant in our squad that was uh, not only me but uh, he picked on all the, our young rec recruits which I was so that was the hard part and uh, uh, when I tell that to friends who read my book they, they, they can't believe that that I, 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 I can say that thing that I had it easy because the, when you read it I guess I do suffer but uh, come come and when I read all these other books these other prisoners suffer way more than I do and when I think about that uh, right now it's it's even in this area it's you can say it's cold and I like to get in a hot tub but uh, uh, at the coal mine, there was a boat builder, a Japanese boat builder who was a prisoner, and he made a Japanese bathtub out of wood, a big bathtub that we could really soak our whole body in. So I, I guess when you think about that, uh, life was, quote, easy. <laughs> uh, listening to uh, er earlier, uh, I, I, I guess there's a lot of things that the Nisei soldiers suffered, but uh, I, I don't, I, and I also mentioned about being almost picked out because I was born in the United States. However, uh, I've heard other experience where uh, Nisei did suffer because of that fact, but I, I can't. I don't think I suffered that way, really. Thank you very much. back even if you hire a lawyer mm -hmm. but if you want to become a natural naturalized citizen you, you can do it that way then that's what I did mm -hmm. so uh, w within a, a few months I regained my citizenship and then I married a, a Japanese woman and <laughs> She, 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 well, after living five years here, she became a citizen. Thank you. You said, you said that there were four things that you talked about, the hunger, the coal, labor, and what was the fourth oh, one? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> other, other prisoners write about it also, but, and they, they write about this, but they, 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 they list that separately from the, the, the three. 
which is indoctrination program. And, the, and I, I got in the very early part of that. And I write about it in my book. But what happens is when we come back, it, 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 it wasn't that intense. And, and it, it, I, when I read these other experiences, they say they, after coming to Nahotka, that's the, the departure place, even after they arrive there, and they have to really hold their breath because until they get on the ship, they don't know what may happen. And sometimes, just like a few hours before they're ordered to get on the ship, they're pulled out and sent back to camp to another camp. They said there, there are very many of those. But there's always things that are, that are dropped. By that I meant, when I come back, there's a, a former Kempe, that's a military policeman. And when I read all these articles, they're on a list. The, the military policemen are all on the list, together with certain other people too, that uh, uh, get like 25 year sentence or things like that. But when I come back, there's even a Kempe who comes back on our ship. And there, I think I write about it, but the, uh, he had some kind of connection with a female Russian doctor. And, and she arranged things for him to come back. And he, he comes all the way back and he gets on the ship and we're on the same ship, mm -hmm. but but that that's the other one. I guess I dropped the, the indoctrination. Uh, uh, this is for the professor. You mentioned that there were some Nisei um, working government in Japan, and I can't remember the, the gentleman's name. But you said that they were uh, really wanted to promote the idea that Nisei could be loyal to Japan. I think there was a couple of people like that you mentioned. So I was wondering what happened to them. If, if they survived the war, have you found anything they wrote about what they thought, or did they ever try to come back to the U.S.? I, I believe. Okay, so you you are so you're referring to these these Nisei writers who mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. who wrote, okay. So one of them, um, Thomas Murayama, he um, after the war. He became the the head of the um, the Japan Boy Scout Federation. He worked very closely uh, with the Americans that way, and his wartime identity as a uh, Japanese uh, propaganda writer had almost instantly been um, forgotten that way. So, um, and not many of I mean, and, and not many of these Japanese American propaganda writers actually got um, prosecuted. Um, some Nisei who served for the Japanese uh, Foreign Ministry's uh, Intelligence Bureau, especially those uh, uh, men and women who um, who worked as um, uh, propaganda radio broadcasters, they 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 got into trouble. Um, there's of course infamous um, Tokyo Rose case involving um, Ida Tabu, but <coughs> but. Um, but that case, that case was almost an exception, and that case was used as sort of a sensationalized case to really um, punish uh, Toguri um, for sort of as an embodiment of this uh, legend of, of Tokyo Rose, rather than what, what she actually did. And and um, and eventually her um, honor and honor was um, uh, uh, restored. Uh, I have a question for all the speakers. Um, I was wondering if um, you could speak a little bit about um, how Japanese could tell that, for the, um, the latter two speakers, um, how you were not like regular Japanese, um, other than speaking English. And for the professor, if you um, have any instances that you've you know, read about sort of more generally. Because um, if you weren't speaking Japanese, but just walking around or um, kind of interacting with people, but not 
yet noticeably um, speaking English, I was wondering how they could tell you were Americans if there were things about the way that you were dressed or the way that you carried yourself or, um, yeah, like if, if there was anything besides language that gave you away as, as different. I, I don't think, uh, I mean, I, I, you don't, you don't have a sign on the same <laughs> 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 so I don't think you can really tell. I don't know, when I arrived there, you know, I was 15 years old, never shaved, and uh, uh, in Japanese, uh, they shave male or female, they, when they're almost babies yet, and by just looking, you can tell that, oh, this guy is, is not Japanese. Mm -hmm. He's American born or something, mm -hmm. because he, just by that, things like that, or, or what you wore, probably. But ordinarily, in, in the military, too, I, I bring it up that it looks like I was picked on, but I, I think some, some uh, niches did get picked on because they were, they found out they were, and it, it was because of an individual, I think. Do, do I make myself good? Why he was picked on. I, I don't think that as a whole, they said that he's Nisei, or they're, they're, there's a group of Nisei here, so let's treat them rough or something. I don't think that happened mm -hmm. ordinarily. She had curly hair, and so she said her father had to take the ironing mm -hmm. and and try to straighten it out for her because uh, women weren't supposed to go to the beauty parlor and have their hair curled or anything like that, and uh, and and the kind of clothing they wore. It, during the war, they had a kokumin fuku. Do you understand that Japanese kokumin fuku? It's a, what would it be in the uh, citizen's uh, uniform or something? Men wore a uh, khaki colored uh, jacket with trousers, and the woman wore monpe, that's uh, pants. I don't know if that yeah, quite answers. That's consistent with what I've what I've read. Yeah. How, how, how about baseball? I mean, I heard that they they actually changed from using the term baseball to yaku. The, the, there, right? there, there is a, a, a manzai. He's a, a somebody a, a comedian who talks, and he he broadcasts a baseball game. <laughs> And strictly Japanese, because the Japanese military didn't have any English. Like they said, I, I mean, like like uh, those uh, who were in transportation, they, they in, in the civilian life they used brakes, handle, or clutch, or things like that. They, the the Ordinary Japanese were using that, but the military didn't allow that. Mm -hmm. So this comedian broadcasts a baseball game using no English, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's able to do that. And, you know, he, he makes up all this Japanese. I still remember that uh, going to a uh, entertainment place where they were where this guy came out, and <coughs> did this, and he was quite a hit. I don't know if that answers. One other question for the last two speakers. Um, could you talk more about when you came back to the United States and you settled into your new lives? Um, did you feel comfortable talking about your experience that you were part of the Imperial Japanese Army within the Japanese American community? Or if you ever did, did how, how did you feel that was received? Or just how did, how did you feel about all of that? Then the Japanese American. <laughs> <laughs> the way I, I, I used to go to a, 
I, I came to the United States and then when I was born a Methodist and when I came back, my parents were living in Palo Alto. They were going to the Japanese Methodist church there. And I went for a while, but then I, I, I changed to a Presbyterian church. And it's, a, it's not a Japanese Presbyterian church. It's a regular church. And uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I didn't try to hide the fact that I was born, I mean, grew up in Japan, but uh, I, I, I don't have, I can't remember any negative feeling or that came because I was in the Japanese military. I have not experienced that. Maybe people might have had some negative feeling, but never mentioned it to me. That I can't, I, I can't say for sure. But I never experienced anything negative about uh, being in the Japanese military. I don't brag about it. <laughs> John. Yeah, I sort of uh, as a follow up to that question, um, as the war progressed and it looked like Japan was going to lose, I was wondering uh, whether the attitude of the other soldiers toward you changed or. Was there any change in that relationship as a result of that? Well, me personally, I didn't know Japan lost the war until about three days after the surrender. And I couldn't believe it. And this was even after I write about it, but I, I'm, I, I'm not in Hyder, I was a little south of that near where it says Chichiharu there. I'm close to there, but uh, we, we come down from the mountain and I get on the train and it, it's a train where they have the, all the refugees on it. And there's women and children on it. And uh, I didn't, when I got off at a, at a station to get something to eat, I overhear one young man saying something like it was a broadcast of a surrender. And I get back on the train and I talk to a fellow soldier that he said there was a radio broadcast about a surrender. And boy, he yells at me and almost, you know, hits me because I say anything like that. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Is what in Japanese he's <laughs> telling me. So, and still, then I think it's two days after that when we finally walk into the camp. And and even the day before that, I, we see uh, Russian soldiers on on trucks passing us. And we, we get off to the side of the road to let the Russians, the Soviet soldiers pass. But uh, it isn't till uh, I write that, try to, emphasize it, but when I walk into the camp and the doors are closed, gates are closed behind us is when we finally understand that Japan lost the war. And I, I don't know if this ties in with it, but the Japanese don't say surrender. They say end the war, end the war. <laughs> All the time you, you read a Japanese newspaper or anything today, it's still <coughs> Shusen. Maybe that has something to do with it, but uh, I don't know if I, if I answered your question. Did you uh, experience an adverse reaction from the Russian soldiers when you were predators? In the early days, I, I write at the, I just mentioned that in a one or two sentence, but the soldier, that were our guards in the early days when we were put into camp at, inside Siberia. 
they kind of treated us rough, sounds like. And then we used to say among ourselves that, you know what, they, they experienced something when they went into Manchuria. And maybe, maybe their buddy got killed or something like that. So they, and, and, but that changed very, very, very soon. And, uh, and then when it came to civilians, they really showed a lot of, quote, respect towards the Japanese. I mean, you, 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 you go somewhere and you talk to the Russian foreman and he asks you questions and if you say you don't know, he, he won't quite accept that. He say, oh, you, you just don't want to tell me. You know it, but you don't want to tell me. It's the kind of attitude they had. That relationship with the Russian was very good. That boy, they, if you know, Japanese are pretty prejudiced people, I think. <laughs> but when it comes to the Russians, it was, you have to respect them for that. They, they, they didn't show that kind of negative attitude at all. Can you give examples of the prejudice? Can you give examples of the prejudice? You said the Japanese are prejudiced. Oh, <laughs> do I have to tell you? <laughs> the, the way the Japanese, uh, uh, well, here is a good example. When Japan lost the war and surrendered, boy, the Manchurian, Chinese, Koreans really took it out on them. Because it's the way they treated the Japanese people. I don't know. Yeah. Even towards now, towards they say, yeah, I, I, I have a friend who says, well, I, I'll expect, I'll, I'll, I'll respect and accept, I'm able to accept Koreans, but I can't black people. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that true. more than once. That's an example, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, you talked about the uh, two worlds of Jim Yoshida, and in that book, I noticed the terrible treatment that as a fairly new recruit, mm -hmm. he was treated, treated um, almost abused by the officers, slapped in the face, right. somebody else kicked them in the stomach. And these are officers that really had no business responding to him that way. He wasn't a bad guy. He was a real nice guy like Jimmy. <laughs> Mr. Nice Guy. Is that a typical behavior of officers? Um, I've actually heard, heard a lot of stories of um, basically, um, <coughs> corporal punishment, uh, phys uh, physical abuse like that. So um, when the, the kind of treatment that Jim Yoshida received from his officers, um, that wasn't an experience that was unique to, to him. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he, he mentions that, I mean, because, well, it's possible that because he was an American citizen, he received um, abusive treatment. But it's, it's also possible that his officers would have found other reasons to abuse him anyway. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, see, one question. Traveling back and forth from Japan to America and America to Japan before and after the war, what type of paperwork did you need? Did you have passports, visas, or did you just get on a ship and go over there and back? Passports, usually. <laughs> and if you lost your passport, what were your options? Uh, U.S. Consulate General in, in, in Japan, or, um, in, or uh, U.S. Embassy in, in Tokyo, yes. Another question? Maybe I'll ask. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I just had one sort of question for the for the professor. You said that there's no official data that can, no official records that can track if the 
US, the Japanese American US citizens in Japan? I would find that hard to believe that they wouldn't have somewhere a record that could keep track of the, uh, the Japanese Foreign Ministry and Home Ministry, they, they tried to keep track of uh, uh, American citizens of Japanese ancestry in Japan. Um, they, they attempted at collecting uh, a number of uh, census records. But those records are very unreliable because many of them um, depend on voluntary submissions from uh, local prefectural governments. A lot of them were depend uh, were from the um, uh, family registry records. Some schools were asked to volunteer um, information about their uh, Nisei students. So, um, and these records often really aren't the most reliable sources. Probably the most reliable source that I found <clears throat> was the Tokyo Metropolitan uh, Police uh, reports from the late 1930s, which means that the Nisei in Tokyo were <coughs> under surveillance by the police. Um, and, and because of the, um, the, the, the manpower and um, the, the, the resources um, available to the police force, those are probably the most reliable sources. But even, so the, 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 police re, the police records from the, the mid-1930s, for, for example, suggested that there were about 450 Japanese-American students studying in Tokyo. That number is probably accurate, but that number doesn't tell us anything about whether these were students who had homes in other parts of Japan, right, who had moved to Tokyo to study, or that their, their, their homes were actually in Tokyo. So um, a lot of the records are, um, th there are numbers, but then numbers don't, don't really tell us um, uh, reliable information about um, the, the exact number and um, whereabouts of the same Japan at um, any, any given moment. So, but if we, if we compare all of the uh, resource, all of the sources that are um, available, um, I think we can we can pretty confidently say that the total number of the Japanese Americans who were in Japan, roughly from the 1920s to the 1940s, probably would have been around 50,000. Take the opportunity to ask one last question from Jimmy. Um, what happened to your your boss, the general of the Kamikaze unit? Uh, uh, I know you have some information about that. Oh, uh, it was the military stuff, so we all um, had to go and sign the paper, and that was it. Once you sign the paper, they'll never check you. And when I went home, this. Uh, Japanese campaign die, they knew that what, what I was doing in the service, but uh, while I served in the paper, and after that, they didn't say nothing, because then they found out that I was born in America, and our whole family was, you know, in America and everything, so. Did your, uh, what, what happened to the actual general who commanded the Kamikaze forces in Riverview? He said you, you read about what happened to him. Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff that was going on, but actually, if you read that, I didn't believe that much. Because I figured Japanese people, if they lost the war, then they would most likely, you know, <laughs> kill themselves, you know. And I had that kind of a thing too, you know. But when I went home, my mother, she didn't know I was coming home, but when she seen me, she should have seen her. She threw the knife while she was cooking, you know, and then she seen me, she threw the knife on the floor and come and hug me. She says, how come you come home alive? <laughs> 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 yeah, I couldn't her. She was happy that, you know, I was, I was still alive. Because before, when I left, my mother says, whatever you do, never surrender. She says, you've got to fight for Japan. I thought I was young anyway. And uh, when I left, 
when I come home, she seen me, she was cooking, and uh, she threw everything that was in the kitchen on the floor and come and, oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, you come home alive. And then on the way home, I had a military uniform on, and uh, I caught the train in Fukuoka, and there was two ladies sitting in front of me, and they were talking to each other, and uh, ten minutes later, one lady stands up, and she grabbed my hands and said, you sit down here. Said, Japan lost the war, but uh, you people are still living, so you sit down, and she gave me the... There was three chairs open, and there was two people there. But you know what we did. I guess she felt that I went through all that tough stuff. So I'll never forget that. And there was a, two ladies doing that, and the other ladies that was two seat behind. <coughs> she stood up, and later on she had a jacket on, and she said, "Sit on this." You know, that. I was treated very good. In that case, even the campaign too, they didn't touch me no more. Stay up to me. I have a follow up. When you went drinking, you kind of this in the year here. Um, did you toast the emperor? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's that whole example of honor yeah. and servitude. Service. And I think it was in the Yoshida book that they would toast the emperor yeah. before yeah. they. Yeah. <clears throat> because we weren't that much uh, treated that bad. But all we wanted to do was just get out and drink and <laughs> get the Japanese people. And if we were feeling good, we'll call them over. And give them H E double L and the, and the Japanese policeman never took us to jail. Yeah, they figured they figured if they did something to us that the Americans gonna do something to them again. So Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's give them all a